I'm David Knowles, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, we analyse the tactics the Ukrainian army used to break the Russian lines in the east, look at what Ukrainian troops and journalists are finding in the liberated territories, and finally, we discuss something that's been on the edge of conversations for many months now, nuclear weapons. We are facing a very serious crisis in energy caused by Putin's war in Ukraine. Nobody's going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Every weekday afternoon, we sit down with leading journalists from the Telegraph's London newsroom and our teams reporting on the ground to bring you the latest news and analysis on the war in Ukraine. It's Wednesday the 14th of September, day 203. And today, I'm joined by Associate Editor Dominic Nichols, Senior Foreign Correspondent Roland Oliphant, and two special guests, author and War Studies Visiting Fellow at King's College London, Dr Mike Martin, and, calling us from Kyiv, Alina Polyakova, Managing Editor at online newspaper Ukranska Pravda. I started by asking Alina how Ukrainians were reacting to the news of the counter-offensive. Hey, guys. Um, the atmosphere in Kyiv um, is quite euphoric. People can do their jobs. Um, we are all immersed in newsfeed, Telegram channels, Twitter, and um, the news are good. So there is, so we are happy, but not too much, uh, because uh, on the one hand we have uh, a lightened counteroffensive in Kharkiv Oblast. And uh, I'm really walking more slowly than Ukrainian Armed Forces Liberated Territories. Uh, and uh, the Minister of Defense of Ukraine uh, said that uh, offensive had gone much better than expected. And uh, Ukrainian Armed Forces regained more than um, 3,000 square kilometers of Ukrainian territory. And that's a significant progress. And, but uh, on the other hand, we understand uh, that it costs lives of our soldiers and the losses on our side will be more heavy during the counteroffensive than during the defense. Um, so the price is high. And Alina, ov- over here in the UK, we, we know that there's a bit of a media blackout on the front lines with journalists are not allowed to get right to the front. So for you in Kyiv, where are you getting your information from? Um, I get my information mostly from Telegram channels, but you need to filter all those information you are getting from there because um, in media uh, we try to fact check all those news before posting and Telegram channels propose different kinds of information. So you need to be critical uh, to all those stuff um, they, they're posting. Alina, when I talked to you before in, in Kyiv a couple of months ago when we were uh, dive-bombed by, by the birds in the cafe, um, I remember asking you whether you thought you were able to plan for the future and you and Ilya Goncharev said that it was impossible because who, who knew what the next few weeks or the next few months would bring. Um, I wanted to ask you that again. Does it, feel like you, does it feel like for you and for other Ukrainians you can finally start thinking of the future or is it too premature? Uh, Well, my plans are a little bit specific now. Uh, My friends and I are getting prepared for the winter. Uh, I have already bought some thermal underwear and uh, I'm thinking about buying a sleeping bag and some dry alcohol for cooking in case there is no electricity and gas and maybe some extra blankets because, you know, um, after the counteroffensive, uh, Russians spoil our party. Uh, they hit a uh, heat power plant in Kharkiv and um, hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians were left without power on 11th of September. And Russia proves that is it's a terrorist state on 9-11. Uh, they love symbolism and it was very symbolic. So now we are planning to uh, go through the winter mostly. You mentioned the 11th of September. Um, what, what what happened when the news came through of the counteroffensive? I mean, you, you, were, were people out having drinks? Did people celebrate it? Or did they sort of note it and then think, well, there's, there's still many months of this to go? Uh, there are no celebrations, um, just uh, good mood, good news. Uh, people who are in phones, but it's quite different uh, when it was on the beginning of the war, uh, when people were very um, 
sad and um, they don't know what to do and now uh, i see some splashes splashes of uh, hope in their eyes you know dom and roland and mike you've been listening to this are there, is there anything you'd like to ask alina to get a sense of what life is like on the ground at the moment yeah hi alina it's, it's dom here um if i could just quickly ask a uh, president zelensky makes his his nightly addresses to the country and he gave a very emotional and powerful speech the other night when he was talking about the contrast with would would Ukraine want to be with with water or without Russia and he was saying without you and and, and that that speech um if you know the one I'm I'm referring to do you know how that how that went down in Ukraine because it has it has reached many many people over here and has been uh, deemed to be a very a very um powerful message to send across um, yes, it was a Twitter trend here in Ukraine, uh, without you, like a hashtag, and people were very excited of this message, um, because, you know, um, uh, during the counteroffensive, um, people propose, uh, people on the deliberated del- territories showing uh, they are greeting to Ukrainian soldiers, they propose them pancakes, borscht, whatever they have, and that proves that um, so-called Russian world uh, exists only in the minds of Russian, and um, there is no Russian world in Ukraine, and uh, people on liberated territories are ready for uh, living without um, heat, without electricity, but also without Russians. I had another question coming in from Mike, I think. Yeah, hi, hi, Alina, thanks. Um, So the Ukrainian government has stated, Alina, that its goal is to remove all of the Russian armed forces from the territory of Ukraine, so including Donbass, including Crimea. What's your feeling of, let's say that that takes another year until next summer in 2023, What's your feeling of whether the population are ready to fight along for another year? Do you think that there's enough support for achieving that goal? Um, well, of course, we are watching not only on Kharkiv region, we are also watching what's going on in Kherson Oblast. And uh, it's an agricultural region, so the Russians could use um, irrigational channels as their defensive trenches. So it's harder to make counteroffensive here. Uh, we're also watching on Zaporizhia and Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. Uh, and, you know, we don't want a new HBO series about Ukraine like that. Um, and we're also waiting for the liberation of Luhansk or Donetsk. Um, and I think we are waiting for this very much. Uh, and personally, I am waiting when in a daily general staff report, I will see not uh, Siversk front, Zaporizhia front, but uh, Belgorod front, for example. Uh, of course, I'm joking, we don't need the territories, we just want our territories back. And I think that we are ready for getting back all our territories, uh, including Crimea and uh, Donetsk and Lugansk Oblast. Well, thank you so much, Alina. Um, thank you for giving us a sense of what life is like on the ground now in Kiev and in Ukraine. Can I turn to Dom and Mike just to give us a bit of an update on the on the front lines in Ukraine? Dom, what's been happening in the past 24 hours? Well, similar to what I said yesterday, we, we, we don't have a huge amount of information because of the the blackout by Ukrainian authorities, which I say, I, th- I think that is the correct thing to do right now. Um, but we think that Ukraine is trying to consolidate the positions it's gained over the last uh, the last few days. Um, we think that Russia have gone firm on the east bank of the Oskil River, so in some places on the river, in other places a few kilometres behind, wherever the ground dictates the best defended positions would be. Um, but we think that there's not a not a, the, the the push has not continued there. Um, I mean, it was a huge advance, so it's unsurprising that, that Ukraine would want to, to to take stock and and reconstitute. And we think that what's happening is that the the troops that have done all that that major push are now being backfilled in many places by soldiers that can that can then hold the ground and start to administer the ground. So so police units and what have you who can who can provide um, the uh, all the 
all the uh, the requirements of a of a of a state security so st- starting from police everything up from from the police to the to the military uh, i mean that's as far as i've been able to tell mike i'd be really really interested if you if you've heard anything else or if you've got any other views on that yeah uh thanks i mean i, th- I think that that's right it's it's actually what alina said was absolutely right <laughs> on social media telegram and whatnot there's just an absolute deluge of information uh and disinformation um I think the Russians tried to stabilize the line um, on the Oskil River, as you said, and they, in some areas they haven't been able to do that. I think what's interesting is if you go east of the Oskil River, there's not many obvious natural defensive points. Um, so they're, and, and you know, plus they've had to abandon lots of equipment and their forces are in disarray and commanders have been killed and so on and so forth. So um, I think there's probably a bit of two things going on. One is the Russians are trying very hard to stabilize the defensive line, which is hard because the Ukrainians are also striking them in, you know, around Lyme and there's still a battle continuing. They're trying to hit the Russians around several Donetsk and Lysychansk as well, which are those two cities that we heard about in the Battle of the Donbass a couple of months ago. Um, I also think it's the as, as important as the offensive in the northeast is i mean psychologically it's massive right because it sort of deals a real blow to the russians and it's you know there's two turning points in the war one was that withdrawal from kiev in april and this is the kind of second major turning point um so psychologically it's really important and war is kind of psychological um but i think um it's it's really tiring for troops it's really logistically intensive so there's a, a what you might call an operational pause, I think, where some of those, as you said, Don, some of those units are, are cycling through to get fresh people up. I think the, what's, a, what's a really interesting question is, and, you know, we've got Kharkiv and then we've got Kherson in the south. While this whole thing's been going on in Kharkiv, the Ukrainians have been making slow but steady progress, not the dramatic gains like we've seen in Kharkiv. They've been making slow progress in the south there's obviously a lot more russian troops in the south which is why the ukrainians one of the reasons why they were able to make such great gains in the northeast um the, but the big question is uh, what what degree of reserves do ukraine have so do they have a third you know got a force in the north got a force in the south do they have a third strategic reserve that they can commit at some point because if they do um, the Russians are in big trouble because they are completely stretched, and in areas their forces are in, like in the northeast and in Donbass, their forces are in complete disarray. Just on that, Mike, do, have you got any clear idea on the numbers that were involved in this push in the northeast in terms of actually how many brigades or or what what Ukraine committed there? And that might give us some indication of whether or not they are likely to have a sizable strategic reserve. No, is the answer. I've got no idea. No, no, same, same as us. No, I mean it's impossible to tell. But you're, you're right. If they've got, if they've got a big force up their sleeve, which has got to be at least, at least kind of divisional size, six, eight, ten thousand, anything less than that, and they're really not going to be able to. Well, what would they want to continue? And what would they want to do with it? Right. I mean, I think one option would be to, you know, uh, cut the. If you look at where the Russian forces are, they're in Donbas, they're along the Black Sea coast, and they're down in Crimea. Um, cutting those two forces in two um, would be quite helpful. So if you, you know, around Mariupol, which was the city that was under siege for such a long time at the beginning of the war, or Melitopol, which is a bit further, bit further south along the coast towards Crimea. It's not quite on the coast, but that's the area in Melitopol. If you could put a, a, a strike through that to, to um, sever the Russian lines of communication, linking up the Donbass and Crimea, um, that would be amazing. But what would that take? I don't know maybe 10,000 troops or something. Mike, last night I was uh, invited, as was uh, Roland and and, um, and Joe from The Telegraph here, with other journalists into a, a background brief from, from Western officials. And one of the things we talked about was the, the Russian forces in the Kurzon. And we were told that there's a lot of a lot of DNR troops there. And I asked why why would DNR troops, so the, the self-proclaimed Donetsk People Republic own militia, why would they be so far out of out of their their backyard basically and if they're not um now i I can caveat this one in a moment if i may but if if they're not elite troops why are they being committed to something a a front of such importance to russia my caveat is of course that that some of these people have been fighting 
for a very long time and are very experienced troops. But generally, I hope I'm, I'm correct in thinking that the DNR are, are not sort of top draw troops. So I just wonder what your thoughts there. Um, so I think over one of the things that the Ukrainians have done brilliantly um, over the last two or three months is misdirect the Russians. And so whilst the Russians were, this, they <laughs> announced that they were going to have this Donbass offensive and did all that you know, terrible artillery and several Donetsk and the rest of it. And whilst they were doing that, the Ukrainians started to prepare the ground in Kherson. They started to hit, and it's particularly when the Western artillery, the long range artillery arrived, they started to hit, you know, command and control in Kherson and Russian command and control and logistics and all the rest of it. And they actually took more territory off the Russians in the south than the Russians managed to take off them in the east, but that was very underreported. And then, of course, about a month ago, we had this announcement that ah, now the Kherson offensive is starting, and the Russians suddenly realized, oh God, that's much more important than Donbass because Kherson is the route to Crimea. And for the Russians, Crimea is the most important thing. That's their strategic center of gravity, followed by the Donbass, which is like Russian speakers. And so as soon as Ukraine announced, you know, they built up pressure, they shaped the battlefield in the south in Kherson. As soon as they announced that this offensive was starting and then started it, the Russians started pulling troops out of everywhere um, in Kharkiv, which is they thinned out the lines, which is one of the things that enabled the Ukrainians to punch through a few days ago. And but also you're telling me that the DNR and uh, uh, Luhansk um, militia as well down in Kherson. So effectively, the Russians must have pulled them down to Kherson. We had reports of Kherson being reinforced with all sorts of people coming from all over the place. Um, so that's why they're down there. Um, why they were personally motivated to do that, I've got no idea. Uh, maybe they were given sacks of cash. But um, I think as well, yes, that, I think I think there's a that's a the term. You know, the 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 DNR troops is a a broad term that will cover both people who've been press ganged last week and have no training. Uh, and also, like you say, people who've been fighting for quite some time, although they've been fighting in an insurgent style. So they might not be accustomed to working in large, you know, formations in a professional army. But so there's a real mix of those guys from, from quite experienced to not experienced, like complete cannon fodder. Thanks, Mike. And thanks, Dom, for that. Um, Roland Oliphant, you've been looking at um, one of the towns that's been liberated by Ukrainian troops, Balaklia. Can you tell us a little bit about what you found when you looked here? How did the Ukrainians take it and what are they finding now they're there? Yeah, so um, our uh, Sergio Olmos, our colleague um, in Kharkiv, uh, was down in Balaklia yesterday um, and I was uh, working with him, kind of getting stuff out. It was one of those situations you sometimes find in, when you're a foreign correspondent. He was saying, look, I'm I'm literally standing room only in this bus. I, there's no way he could type anything. So it was a, a dual effort. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the, fir- the first thing, to, I think, to point out about what we're seeing out of Balaclia, you'll see it in every single newspaper today, every single television station, um, the BBC, uh, the Today Broken, everything. Everything's coming out of Balaclia. That's because the Ukrainians have an extremely tight leash on uh, media operations in the East. Basically, journalists are banned from the front line. Um, this wasn't the, the very first time journalists got into one of these liberated areas outside Kharkiv, but it was a big trip. Um, organized uh, basically by the Ukrainian authorities. Um, So bear that in mind when you're reading these reports. I think context is quite important. Um, So what did we find? I mean, mean, Sergio talked about a town that um, was not devastated. It it wasn't one of these towns that looked like Stalingrad and had been, you know, burnt out from, um, you know, from pavement to to rooftop. Um, Definitely some kind of damage and fighting. Um, Kind of, kind of what what came through is this characteristic combination of there's shock, there's there's relief, um, there's happiness, um, and and the the kind of the interviews Sergio was doing and that he was sharing with me, this really came across. Um, people kind of speaking to him, I, it's strange, you know, like this, your voice kind of trembling between kind of happiness and then then you know it begins to crack and you think god is this woman going to break into tears um and that's uh it's just a relief for me the main thing which i think you get uh, quite often when when people are, are liberated from by, by whichever side is there and they think the fighting has gone on was saying you know it's incredibly scary first the russians came in um 
they captured Balaclia in, I think it was March 4th. It's a very, very, like, after the first week of the war. Um, that was scary. We, we, we had to live in the basement for a month without moving because of all the fighting. Then we came out, and then we found ourselves basically all through summer kind of tending the vegetable garden, trying to grow crops because the shops weren't really working. Um, and we kind of got used to things. As we understand, Balaclia wasn't really hit at that point. Um, and then this recent battle was just incredibly, incredibly scary from the witnesses we spoke to. Um, and they said as, as uh, once our guys came in, that she meant the Ukrainians, uh, the Russians started hitting us. It was absolutely dreadful. Um, but, you know, speed of advance. By the time the press was in there yesterday, I mean, the front line is already way over at the Oskol River. Um, so, so pretty safe. Um, what else do we find? I mean, you'll see lots of reports about the police station. So it turns out that it looks like the Russians used the police station as their own security center. Um, they they showed journalists this basement, which they said was used as a, a torture chamber, interrogation chamber. There was a guy who gave his name as Artyom. He said he was held for um, 46, that's four, six days. Um, and, and the account he gave us was, well, for most of that, they didn't really bother me. So basically he said he was arrested on the street um, they searched his. They'd searched his apartment, and they found photographs of his brother. His brother is a Ukrainian soldier. Um, he said to us, "Oh, they just assumed that I must have something to do with the army as well." They arrested me. They put me in this basement um, for forty-six days or so, a month and a half, and they didn't touch him. They didn't mistreat him. But just before they let him go, they decided to give him a real going over, um, wired him up to a generator, um, and used electric shock torture to kind of like, "Come on, tell us what you know." What is your brother doing? What's he doing? And he said, well, I mean, even if I wanted to say something, I couldn't because I've been sitting in a basement for six weeks, didn't know anything. Um, eventually, he's let go. There was a really nasty detail he talked about was how um, there was an air conditioning unit down. It was quite noisy. And the Russians used to turn it off. And he was fairly convinced they were doing that. So the noise went down and other people could hear the screams of people being um, mistreated. Um, the governor of Kharkiv Oblast was there. He was talking about... They're investigating five civilian deaths so far. Um, uh, Sergei saw two bodies being bagged up and inspected by the Kharkiv police. Um, the police say witnesses told them these guys were shot on the 6th, which I think is Tuesday, which I think was either the day the offensive began or or, or, or just before it. Um, and witnesses seem to say these guys were driving a vehicle, they're civilians, near or through a Russian checkpoint, and the Russian soldiers opened fire, not clear why. Um, so definitely, um, you know, evidence of nasty things happening. I would caveat it saying what we saw doesn't at this point look like a butcher. Uh, we did not see bodies lying everywhere, and it didn't look from what Sergio saw as if the Russian army had gone crazy and just massacred people. Um, but that that is the glimpse. Do, do read Sergio's dispatch. Um, uh, well, our dispatch, <laughs> um, which is in today's paper, um, which should give you a flavour um, of that. Thanks very much for that, Roland. Uh, Alina Polyakova, can I come back to you on that? I'd, I'd be very interested to hear to hear your reaction to what Roland's just been talking about. Um, and also ask you, as we said, it's very difficult for Western journalists to get to the front lines sometimes, unless it's very controlled by the Ukrainian military. How, how are you finding it with, you, with your journalists at Ukrainska Pravda? Uh, well, um, it's very hard to, for us to read uh, such news because, uh, you know, um, you become very happy from the news like Ukrainian defenders reach border with Russia or Ukrainian flag is raised in another village, uh, which really make my heart beat faster. But uh, then appear news like uh, 200 Russian war crimes documented on liberated territories of Ukraine each day or that some bodies of tarted civilians uh, have been found in a village in liberated uh, cities or villages. And um, that's really scary. And uh, my colleagues are going to the front, front line. And uh, today they are in Balaklia and uh, in uh, Donetsk. Uh, it's um, re uh, cities we, uh, which were liberated uh, last week, I think several days ago, um, but uh, it's very hard for them too, to um, get all the documents uh, to get there. And what kind of stories are, are they hearing? I mean, we've, we, Roland talked about some of the experiences of civilians in Balaclia. What, what are your journalists finding out in the liberated territories? 
Um, um, they were speaking with um, different uh, people and uh, all of them are glad to greet uh, Ukrainian soldiers, uh, to see Ukrainian people, to speak Ukrainian. And um, they told that uh, Russia uh, is very cruel and um, that uh, they have some um, chambers, uh, some prisons uh, where take people who uh, are disagree uh, with uh, their politics. And um, I hope that uh, soon we will get some report from uh, my colleagues. But for now, they are very uh, scared of all the um, things that Russians uh, are ready to do with people who are uh, so um, come to liberate. Thank you very much, uh, Alina. Can we zoom out slightly? So we've we've talked a bit about updates on the counteroffensive. We've then zoomed in on uh, Balaklia and talked a little bit about what journalists and soldiers have found there. Um, Mike Martin, Dr. Mike Martin, can I come to you? You've written a fascinating piece in The Telegraph a couple of days ago. Uh, it was your take on the counterattack in, in the sort of early hours, in the, in the, the few days after we knew it was going on. Um, you wrote a lot of interesting things. You, you said that the Russians, quote, might have crossed a point of no return. Can you explain to us what you meant by that? Yeah, well, it, it, it's about the um, integrity and cohesion of the Russian army. It's a little bit about what I was talking about earlier, is whether they can stabilise the front line. Um, and, and, we've, and, and since I actually wrote that piece a couple of days ago, we've heard some really interesting things that are in the same kind of vein. So obviously war is psychological and if you kind of break through someone's lines or destroy their command elements or take out their logistics or get behind them what these people are all human beings and particularly you know the russian army is very poorly trained conscripts most of them um you know they run away they take their clothes off you know the army starts to disintegrate and people stop following orders and people abandon equipment and you know discipline goes and because of the way that the Ukrainians executed their attack, basically a form of maneuver warfare, getting behind the Russians, so on and so forth. Um, that was, it was perfect. It created that fear and that panic, and you had you know all sorts of things. So, Izum was surrendered by the Russians. They just left, and then the Ukrainians were able to occupy it, for instance. And the, what I mean by that point of no return is, can they reconstitute an army under discipline that, is, that they are able to use to do things? And since since the, the sort of initial Ukrainian thrust through the lines, we've seen a few interesting things, and we don't know whether these are these uncorroborated. But we've heard some early reports that the Russians are no longer sending reinforcement units to Ukraine because they had a number of units that they tried to send. This is just in the last couple of days who refused to go. So I think that's really really interesting. Um, we've also seen uh, within Russia itself. Um, some of the pundits on TV who are normally completely sycophantic about the whole thing um, also starting to, I guess the way to summarise it is the blame game is starting. You know, who's responsible for this special military operation, all that kind of stuff. Like, it's interesting, the day that the, day that the Russian lines collapsed, was, uh, Putin was opening, opening a Ferris wheel in Moscow, which was, you know, not a good look. Um, and and so there's these little things like this. You know, we've also got some councillors, local councillors in St. Petersburg, criticising Putin, not immediately disappearing, you know, getting lots of support from the Russian population. Um, so I, I think, you know, in the psychological realm, once these things are broken, once the Rubicon has been crossed, oh, wow, our army just got, you know, a large section of our army just got defeated. You know, the first guard tank army, which is supposedly this, you know, be like the desert rats in the UK or something, you know, an iconic unit. Uh, once they've been defeated in the field, like removed as a military unit, which is what UK defense intelligence is saying, this is big stuff, right? And it causes people to uh, ponder whether actually they can continue to fight. And that's what it's all about. It's about the will to fight. And it, they, they've got a real uphill challenge, they being the Russians, have got a real uphill challenge of getting the other, getting back to a situation where they have a cohesive, disciplined force 
um, that they're able to, you know, conduct operations with, as opposed to at the moment, I suspect a lot of them are just fighting for their lives because they're under Ukrainian attack, like in Kherson. So that's what I meant by kind of crossing this line. I think it will be very hard for them to put back together a disciplined force. Thanks, Mike. I have two questions for you, and then I'd like to invite Alina Dom and Roland to, to, to join in as well. But just, just my two first. Um, over the last few days, we've had some inkling of the kind of tactics uh, and strategy the Ukrainian army has employed. We've talked about thunder runs, um, but you touched on it just just then, the sort of the, the manoeuvre warfare. Could you go into a little bit more detail as the days have gone on? What more do we know about what the Ukrainians actually did to pull off such a stunning victory? Uh, so, so because the Russians are thinned out the lines normally when you're defending a line you have what's called defense in depth so you've got units stacked behind each other so you can give away and then tempt your enemy in and then you know but they they only had literally one line of troops and so what the ukrainians uh, in, to the east of kharkiv could do is once they punch through that line they use a little bit of armor to punch through that line and then they use mechanized troops so in vehicles not very heavily armored vehicles and just dashing, this is called a thunder run thing, you spoke about, that's another term for it. And what they did is they bypassed Russian combat troops or lots of pockets of combat troops and just went straight for um, logistics. And they used their you know, artillery and stuff like that to, to continue to target Russian command and control. And so that does a couple of things. It Basically, armies can't fight without communications, leadership, or logistics. And if you if you successfully interdict those three, you don't need to worry about the fighting troops. Um, and that's effectively what they did. And so the, the reason they went to uh, Kupiansk and Izum was they were both railway junctions. And the Russians, the way the Russians work, they do a lot of their logistics by rail. Um, think back to the Cold War. Their idea about fighting in Europe was all about moving forward and having railways bringing up all the stuff because they saw themselves fighting a land war um the west doesn't do railway logistics but the ukrainians who obviously were part of the soviet union uh, a couple of decades ago a few decades ago understand this very well so they understood that if they interdicted kupiansk and Zoom, uh that would basically cut off the russians ability to fight right as soon as they got kupiansk the russians surrendered the Zoom because Zoom is on the end of the the other end of the railway that passes through Kupiansk. So it's actually about striking these things that aren't actually combat troops, because once you deal with them, leadership, communications and uh, logistics, the combat troops melt away. I mean, assume the Russians left and left all their equipment. So not only did they not have to fight them, but they inherited all of their equipment. Um, so it, it's a, <clears throat> it, it's the opposite, if you like, of, Traditional warfare, which is what the Russians have practiced, right? Their whole thing in Donbass was this kind of, you know, artillery barrage and then kind of, you know, World War, imagine World War I, that kind of thing. Big artillery barrage, you know, troops lumbering forward, you know, lots of casualties, but very slow sort of grinding, like moving forward. And it works, but it's very costly to your, you know, supplies, your own men, all the rest of it. But if you've only got poorly trained conscripts, you can only really do attritional warfare. Um, Maneuver warfare, on the other hand, relies on highly trained troops with high levels of morale. And particularly what's important is junior leadership, right? So your lieutenants, your sergeants, your captains, your majors, because those are the guys who are going to be operating at the heads of these columns, you know, far behind Russian lines, interdicting logistics and, you know, command and control and stuff like that. And they've got to be given independence and told to get on with it. And the Russians, by contrast, have this very hierarchical, top-down, sclerotic system. I mean, it mirrors their country. Um, and, and they're not able to make these quick decisions. So they're only able to fight this sort of very slow, lumbering, attritional warfare. Well, thank you very much, Mike. Um, I'll come back to my question in a bit, actually. But um, Dom, Alina and Roland, do you have any anything to add to that or any questions for Mike? Interestingly, so this, this whole thing about the Russian collapse, right? So the, the briefing... I just want to touch on that because there are some mixed messages coming from the Ukrainian side and from their Western allies. So the briefing you, Dom and I are on yesterday, the Western officials very much managing expectations, right? Saying, look, this isn't a turning point. Um, in the technical military sense, it was not a route. It was most likely 
there was an order given by the Russian general staff to retreat to the Oskil River to shorten the line, and some units broke and routed within that. Um, so a very clear kind of, I mean, I, I read that as a kind of management of expectations, essentially. Um, um, on, on the other hand, you know, I was speaking to Sergei Gaidai, the, um, uh, the governor of Luhansk region, um, yesterday, who, who who gave me again that that narrative. Look, he said he said this went exactly as planned, but instead of getting an A, we got an A plus, and it was the Russians who put the A plus on because they literally just fled. Um, and then you know people who Sergio was speaking to in in, in Balaclia yesterday. This is this is um, one woman. Um, Oh, God, they bombed everything, houses, everything. They then started running, hiding. There were no bikes and no cars. They stole the cars and looted, um, and, and they, just, they just legged it. Um, so we've got two quite different pictures um, kind of picking up, and I, I kind of put this down to the whole fog of war business, really. But that was, that was just the one little um, comment I wanted to make there. Thanks, Roland. Um, Alina Rodon? Uh, well, I have a question. Um, how do you think, um, will Russians uh, fight or um, they can just uh, run away like uh, it was um, some kind on the Kharkiv direction? Yeah, I think it's a great question. I think actually what the Ukraine is doing is exactly right. Um, you don't want to fight a, an attritional war with the Russians. What you want to do, because you, your troops are more highly trained, they have much better morale, and they have, you know, good levels of Western weaponry, which will continue, hopefully. Um, actually, what they did in Kharkiv, that style of warfare, getting behind the Russian lines, um, taking out logistics, command and control, that's exactly what the Ukrainians want to do because the Russian troops are have got low morale and they're poorly trained. And basically, it's like this. Why would you want to fight and kill every last one of them? It's, it's much easier to, to get around behind them and get their lines to collapse and they'll run away. And we've already seen all these cars, all the collaborators crossing the border. It's much better. It's much more artful in warfare, if we're talking about it in that sense, um, to get your enemy to run away, then you don't need to fight them. Um, and, you know, it, 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 it's a cleverer form of warfare. Um, it's less, it's less, you know, you spoke earlier, Lena, about uh, the Ukrainian army casualties less intensive on Ukrainian army casualties. Um, it means you don't have long protracted battles, which means civilian areas don't get so damaged. Um, so what you're doing is exactly the right thing, um, but you just need to keep thinking, right, where are the Russian weaknesses? Brilliant, we can punch through there, we can take out their logistics. And in that way, you will accelerate the collapse of the Russian army. Mike, I have a question, if I may. Uh, you were talking about red lines earlier on. There's a lot of discussion social media and elsewhere about um, Russia's tactical nuclear weapons and the point at which they may they may be used. Now, and you've been very firm on your view here all the way through. I just wonder if you could sort of outline for the for our listeners your your position there and, and when and how might they be used and why why they might uh, we might be quite far from that decision. I just want to stress there's no such thing as a tactical nuclear weapon. And what people say when they mean that is one with a small yield that you might use on a battlefield. Um, as opposed to a capital city. And the reason there's no such thing as a tactical nuclear weapon is because they're all strategic, okay? A nuclear weapon is a nuclear weapon. Um, there's no distinction made in, in how people respond to a tactical versus a strategic nuclear weapon. And um, Putin very much sees himself <clears throat> as the uh, successor to the Soviet Union. In fact, he sees himself recreating the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union in America for a long time had uh, norms on the use of nuclear weapons that were observed. And, you know, loosely, as your listeners will know, that was around mutually assured destruction. If one side used them, then the other side's going to use them. And, and, and we're all dead, basically. Um, I think in addition to that, if you look at the Cold War period, a number of wars were fought. Um, Afghanistan is the kind of best example where one side was actually engaged in the fighting, in this case, the Soviet Union, and the other side supplied huge amounts of weaponry, so America to the Mujahideen in Afghanistan, and training advisors and all the rest of it. So, you know, fairly similar to what we're seeing now. And there was no question of nuclear weapons being used uh, in, in that war. And then there's obviously, you know, Korea, Vietnam, you know, there's, there's echoes that go the other way as well. 
Um, I think in Putin's mind, you know, that's the background, but actually in his mind now in terms of his decision-making around use of nuclear, we haven't even seen use of chemical weapons, right? In terms of use of nuclear, he cannot be certain that if he w is not to use a nuclear weapon, that uh, one won't be used back against him. There's three nuclear powers that are directly involved in this conflict, right? In addition to Russia, that's France, the UK, and America. And he can't be sure that his use, Russian use of a nuclear weapon won't immediately end his presidency and probably his life and might also result in a strike on Moscow. And we've got no idea what conversations have been had under the table. But I think to me, it's pretty clear that there are red lines around this conflict. It's being kept within the borders of Ukraine. Um, it, you know, that's been sort of very given that message been very clearly by the Western allies. And I, I suspect this conversation is happening between Russia, America, Britain and France around how this conflict is to be kept contained. Because, you know, this sort of mad dictator idea, it gets bandied about a lot. But um, you don't get to be a, you know, the leader of a place like Russia if you're mad. No, you're incredibly strategic most of the time. He's made a, a terrible blunder here in Ukraine that will probably cost him his career but he doesn't want it also to cost him his life um, Mike w w just on that what do you make of uh, something that pe people talk about a lot excuse me I'm struggling to get my words out here um, when, when, when we talk about the, the tactical nuke issue that's been going on on um, for, for months, really, since the beginning of the war, people have been talking about this. You know, people will then start talking about the escalation ladder and people point out that there are more steps on the ladder before you get to the point where you might actually use a nuke. And I mean, a couple of a couple of possibilities kind of to send a signal have been raised to me. One was, well, just put a couple of um, Iskanders with or say that they've got nuclear warheads on them and kind of publicly deploy them in Crimea just to kind of send a message. Don't have to use them. You don't have to, you know, make sure you can use them but sending that message. Or even, you know, after that, there's the opportunity of, uh, you know, a, an atmospheric nuclear test on the Via Zemlya, maybe, which would scare the bejesus out of everyone but isn't actually um, using that. I mean, can you, can you see them doing things like that? Um, well, on the first one, I mean, we have already seen that in this conflict, haven't we? We've heard Putin talking in very unsubtle language about, you know, if anyone interferes, you know, the, I can't remember the words, but, you know, the, you know, the gravest consequence, you know, blah, blah, blah. So he's already sort of putting his nuclear forces on high alert and stuff at the beginning of the conflict. And that turned out to be a bluff, didn't it? Um, and as for an atmospheric nuclear test, I mean, I, I just cannot see the NATO allies allowing a a European, effectively Russia. You know, Russia is a Eurasian country, but you know, a leader in Europe using nuclear weapons, even as a, even as an air test. I just I uh, I don't see it. I think I think it's too in Putin's mind. He, Escalating this conflict is not something that he wants to do because he's losing it. And escalating a conflict that you're losing is likely to mean that you're likely to lose faster. Um, I just cannot see America, the UK, France, you know, other, other NATO powers standing by while that goes on. Mike, can I just go back to um, Alina's question and just try and draw out another side of it? Um, you've talked about the collapse of the Russian army in the east. Um, do you think that that's the start of the dominoes falling for for the Russian campaign in Ukraine, or is there a, is there a way they they could they could um, stimmy or end end the the retreat? Uh, I think I think they I think they will be able to stem the the flow at some point. They've got to establish a defensive line somewhere. Um, but will they be so? You know, just because they're not moving any further backwards, will they be able to reconstitute effective fighting force? Uh, that is the thing I'm not sure about. And then that comes into when the Ukrainians pull up their next formation. You know, there's a reserve somewhere, isn't there? When they pull up that formation, the Russians won't be able to won't be able to defend against it. And, and like I said, I think we're probably before winter this time. It's probably a bit short, but next spring, um, once you know, Ukraine's had a whole whole winter of being armed by America and Europe, and had a chance to do more training because there'll be less fighting going on. Um, 
you know, I think that Ukraine is trending up and Russia is trending down, I guess, overall. And just finally from uh, me, Roland and yourself have talked about nuclear weapons and discussed it a little bit. But if if you be- if as you believe Putin wouldn't use a tactical nuclear weapon, a nuclear weapon, what what are his options right now? If, if as you say, Ukraine is trending up, Russia is trending down, what can he actually do? What is there anything? I, I mean, his best bet is to try and sue for peace. But I, I I understand that they've already reached out and the Ukrainians have told them to jump. Um, so I. It's it's hard to see. Okay, so in military terms, it's hard to see how they can regain that situation. Like it's been a disaster. It's been a complete disaster right from the start. And not only has it been a disaster in physical terms, but the whole world has realised that the you know this Russian army is, is a complete paper tiger. Um, so I, it's hard to see what they can. They can, they'll never recover that in reputational terms. Um, and in military terms, it's very hard to see what they can do without, you know, people talk about mobilizing lots of troops and all the rest of it. But like, so what? It takes six months to commission that army into the field. Even, you know, even in a country that's effective, you can't just take civilians and throw them to the front line. They'll all die. So it, and, and again, that would create all sorts of problems at home with unrest and, you know, conscripting kids and stuff. So I, I find that very difficult. We've sort of discussed newts. I find that very difficult. Maybe they could try and draw down to Crimea, but the Ukrainians are not going to stop, are they? They're just going to keep hammering away at it, and they'll, I think they'll get it eventually. Turning the question around, um, what has this counterattack shown us about Ukraine? And this question really firstly is for Mike and, and then for Alina. Um, it, what it's done is it's demonstrated to some of the nations like Germany uh, that were less forthcoming in arms deliveries that Ukraine can win. I think... A number of us have been saying since the beginning that Ukraine is probably likely to win this because of the fundamentals that we spoke about. Um, but I don't think that's been clear in, say, Berlin or, or Paris to a lesser degree. So I think that's really, really important that they've demonstrated success and that will keep the weapons and the support um, online. So I think that's really, really important. And for you, Alina, and for other Ukrainians, what does this counterattack uh, show? What does it mean? Oh, it gives us hope uh, that uh, someday we will live a normal life. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for your thoughts today. Can I just get your final thoughts? Uh, Dom Nichols. Well, we need to see what this consolidation looks like in northeast Ukraine. And if, I really doubt it, but if Russia is able to manage any kind of local counterattack before Ukraine cements in these gains... Russia should be trying to put put something together to push back right now that Ukraine is at its most vulnerable now since it launched this counteroffensive. So they should be trying to push back somewhere, somehow. Um, so keep an eye out for that. I don't think it's, it's going to happen. I don't think they've got the materiel and the personnel, and I certainly don't think they've got a plan. Thank you, Dom. Roland Oliver. Um, I think... It's very worth watching um, the fallout of this in Russia. I mean, we've talked a little bit about, you know, these pundits showing up on state TV. We had Boris Nadezhdin, uh, that uh, Duma deputy, the other day saying, look, it's impossible to beat Ukraine. We've had more of them um, just recently on um, on Sovelyov's uh, talk show, you know, saying, frankly, like, you know, get to grips with the fact it's a defeat. And, and we've had debates now on Russian TV where people are kind of pushing back at this idea that the Ukrainians are not a country and they don't have their own language. And people saying, no, come on, like, no, wonder they're fighting back against us like you can't say that to people um now that that's not doesn't mean everything's changing in russia but it's very interesting to see that i think this has been a big blow to brand putin and the other thing that's really interesting is today uh, reuters have this exclusive um they've spoken to three people they say are close to the kremlin um who say dmitry kozak um one of the deputy chief of staffs close to putin put together a plan um a peace plan which said, OK, Ukraine will not join NATO just as the war is beginning. And Putin knocked it back. Um, that doesn't necessarily surprise me. What surprises me is that people are talking to Reuters. People in Moscow are talking to Reuters and getting this out there now. Um, there was always a moment in Russia over this past 20 years when, when you're a reporter where everything seems turgid and no one will talk to you. We've always been waiting for this moment when the log pile is going to start to roll. And we don't know when it's going to be, but I think we're entering a moment now where, you know, very interesting things um, could happen. I think this is the biggest blow to brand Putin 
uh, that I can remember, to be honest. Thank you, Roland. Um, Mike, would you like uh, to give us your final thoughts? What should our listeners be thinking of? Ukraine's going to win the war and Putin's going to be evicted from power because of it. That's it. And Elena Polyakova, as our guest, calling in from Kiev, what are your final thoughts? Um, I will repeat myself, but I'm going to repeat this as many times as it's needed, that it's necessary to designate Russia a terrorist state and to straighten sanctions against it and also to give Ukraine more weapons. Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first 30 days completely free at telegraph.co.uk slash audio. And sign up to Dispatches, our Ukraine newsletter, which brings stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. If you enjoyed this podcast, please consider following Ukraine The Latest on your preferred podcast app. And if you have a moment, leave a review as it helps others find the show. You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing podcasts at telegraph.co.uk. We do read every message. And we are especially interested to hear where you are listening from around the world. Ukraine The Latest is produced by Giles Gear, Louisa Wells and Isabel Bougard.